Well, hello, everybody. I'm sure glad to see everybody. A, kind of a momentous day. We've got Alberto coming in, tropical storm and Memorial Day, and yet you still come out to hear and worship, and so I appreciate that so much. Doesn't like shoulders, does it? So, today we're going to do a little biblical time traveling. And as you can probably guess from the scripture that's being read, our first stop today is going to be in God's throne about 2,700 years ago. And uh, then we'll go to first century Galilee where Jesus is uh, teaching to the crowd, and then we'll come back here to present time. Um, I wanted to start us off today with an allegory, a uh, metaphor which helps to demonstrate the kingdom of God and, and what it's all about. And uh, this story is about Bobby and Susie, two adolescent children. And every summer, they went to Grandma and Grandpa's place, spent a whole month there, usually in July, and uh, it was a wonderful time. Grandma and Grandpa had a farm, fenced-in yard, nice house, there was a big garden, they had chickens and they had ducks, there was a few acres of woods in the back and a stream that ran through it, and there was fish and they could go fishing, and they just had a great time. Grandma and Grandpa loved them, and they dearly loved them, too. And so this particular summer started off just like many of the others. Their parents came and, and they uh, dropped them off and then they had uh, lunch together. And then at a certain point, mom and dad would go back to the city and then um, they would stay and, and the uh, time together would begin. After lunch, Bobby he was a little bored, so he decided to go wandering around, and he went here, and he went there, and then he spied the duck family, Mama Duck and her little ducklings, and they were quacking around, and he thought it'd be fun, so he picked up a rock, and he threw it. Well, the rock sailed a little bit. It didn't go where he hoped it would, and it hit one of the ducklings in the head and killed it, stone dead. He looked around, horrified. Nobody was, was uh, yelling, nobody had seen it. So he quickly went over and he got grandma's garden spade and buried the duck in the corner of the garden, took a rake, smoothed it over, looked around. Still nobody had discovered this deed. He figured, well, maybe I'll get over. Who's to say where a, a duckling went? There's a lot of them, they might not even miss one. So he starts going to the house and lo and behold, he sees in the upstairs window his sister had been watching the whole thing. Hard stare. He was undone. Oh, what am I going to do? Well, there wasn't anything to do. He went in and he played it out. We'll see what happens. So he goes back in and there was some time and discussion and games and mom and dad leaves. Susie didn't say anything. He's thinking, wow, my sister, maybe she's cool. Maybe she's not going to say anything. Maybe it'll work out. Supper comes, nice supper together. Then Grandma says, well, Susie, I want you to help me with the dishes tonight. It'll be your turn to go first. And they start to get up, and Susie says, no, Grandma. Bobby said that he wanted to do those dishes for me. And she gives him an evil stare. He sa Grandma says, is that right? Yes, Grandma. I, I wanted to do that. I owe her one. So he does, does the dishes. The next morning, breakfast, same thing. Well, we're going to get started on today. Uh, you know, Susie, it's your turn to do the dishes. No, Bobby's going to do those for you. Well, Grandma's, uh, Grandpa's going to go into town and go to the hardware store. Bobby, won't you go with him? And then I'll do a little canning. Susie, you can help me. No, no. Bobby said he didn't want to go to town. I'm going to go with Grandpa. And he'll stay here and do the canning. And so it went day after day after day. Susie got to do all of the good things. 
She had fun. She went swimming. She got to do all the things that was great about the farm. Meanwhile, Bobby was in a work camp. And worse yet, every time he looked at that garden, the place where he had buried that duck haunted him. He couldn't even stand to go out there. Finally, after a number of days, maybe a week, his heart broke, and it was the same old thing. Going to do this, going to do that. No, Bobby's going to do it for him, so he, for her. So um, he finds himself working in the kitchen with Grandma, and he came clean. He said, Grandma, I've got to tell you something. Grandma says, tell me what? Go ahead. And he says, well, I know you're going to hate me, but I killed one of your little ducklings. I, I was out there. It was an accident. I threw this rock. I just wanted to scare him, but the rock sailed, and it hit one in the head. And then I panicked, and I buried it in the garden, and it is just killing me. I can't stand to go out there. It, it just tears my heart out. And and then Susie has been dragging me from one spot to another, and I have to do everything that she doesn't want to. I've completely destroyed my summer. I know you hate me, and I don't blame you if you call Mom and Dad to send me home tonight. I'm ready to go. And she said, um, first of all, she takes her aprons, and she dr dries his tears because he was very upset. And said, I don't hate you. I love you unconditionally. Now, listen to me. This is the point. This is the main deal here. The only question about the whole thing, because I w your sister wasn't the only one that watched things from the window. I seen you kill a duck. I seen you bury it. And I've seen every hour of what has been going on ever since. I've known about it. The only question is when you were going to come to me and tell the truth so that I could forgive you. A prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray to you on this Memorial Day, a day when Alberto, our first tropical storm, is here. And we pray with a grateful heart, and we thank you for this time and for your scripture and for each other that you would bless us with discernment and fellowship and, and love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's do a little time travel like I, I told you about before, and we're going to jump back to a trial, chapter 5 of Isaiah, and we read that the nation of Israel, the whole nation, is on trial. And uh, the setting... God starts this off in this courtroom with a, uh, an opening statement, which is a love song about the vineyard. And uh, the vineyard, of course, is Jerusalem. And he loved and tendered the vineyard, and it, but it only yielded bad grapes. So God took away the protective walls and the hedges, and he brought in briars and thawls, and he, and he stopped it from raining. And then he moves to, after that opening statement, the six, the six um, woes, which are indictments. And this is the indictments that God gives the nation of Israel. One, they're land grabbers. They add house to house and field to field. It sounded like, amazing like, corporate farms, and maybe even some of our megachurches today in the United States. They're not sat we're not satisfied with what we, we have. We, we want to create these empires. Number two, the second indictment, party animals. They live to chase parties, banquets, concerts, morning and night. It's pretty self-explanatory. Three... They were arrogant. Draw sin with deceit and wickedness with a harness. My sins don't count. I'm different. I'm from a chosen race. But I don't think that the good Lord sees it that way. Four, liars. Call evil good and good evil. 
The most successful thing that Satan has ever done with mankind was half God said. Did he really say that? Does the Bible mean that? Really? Does it mean that for me or does it mean it for somebody else? These things, it's really old information. Maybe it doesn't even apply today. But it all boils down to the hum human humanity's belief that there is no absolutes. Warren's truth might be different than mine. Tom's is, pretty, is different. I don't know if I have to accept his truth. So the absolutes. Five, conceit. They were wise and clever in their own eyes. And that goes back to the original sin of pride. And six, they were corrupt. And it says they took bribes and denied justice, which we know God has no use for that. He, is, he administers perfect justice, and he is the perfect judge. And that is a bar that we'll never reach, but we're supposed to try, and at least not take a bribe and, uh, and pad our way for friends and associates and hang others out to dry. So after they went through that, and uh, again, we're in this, uh, the God's throne room, like it's been read. We have the seraphim sang and glorified God, and their voices shook the doorposts and thresholds, and the temple was filled with smoke, undoing him. And what that really reminded me is reading this scriptures of what happened on the mountain when the Ten Commandments were delivered, and there was these peals of thundering, lightning, and smoke, and the people told Moses, no, you go up there. We'll be fine right here. And I think that that was what was going on uh, with uh, Isaiah, too. And what he did out of that is he produced the seventh woe. <laughs> me. <laughs> woe is me. I'm, a, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. But unlike the other woes, we know that Isaiah was the humble servant. And um, one of the seraphim flew to him with a live coal from the altar. When I was researching this sermon, um, as an author, I do a lot of research, and what I like to do is come up with images so that I can describe it in the text. And so I really kind of spent some time on the seraphim. And most of them come from a lot of old paintings, and they invariably were beautiful pictures of young men and young women, and they're sort of angelic, and they have the wings, and they're kind of floating around, and it's bright and beautiful. But this one artist came up with something that's pretty close to exactly what uh, Isaiah described, and it was wings covering the face, wings flying, and wings covering the bottom of this being's body and two piercing eyes coming out of it. I was like, ooh, I can't unsee that. And uh, so it reminded me that eternity, um, where God lives, there's a variety of things going on up there. And uh, me as an American male are, are going to be really in the minority. In fact, there's, it's just going to be awesome and it's wonderful and there are a lot of things going on creatures that we have no idea are about. But anyway, this seraphim approaches him and touched his lips with this live coal, and it took away his uh, guilt and took away his sin. It was atoned for. And it seemed to empower him because instead of hiding down around the doorpost and hoping that he didn't die, the next thing he hear, heard was, you know, challenge, who's going to go tell the people the verdict, my, my uh, judgment of this nation? And he volunteers, me, send me. Kind of reminded me a little bit of Peter after the Pentecost, and he stood up and he was like, you, you're the ones. So um, he was empowered, and he was forgiven, and he was ready to serve. And there was no more woe as me. And so the pronouncement was, and I know this is a little different way of viewing this, 
But this was the verdict, and we know when God speaks, it becomes reality. He speaks things into reality. And so this was the verdict. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they may see with their eyes, with, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts and be turned and be healed. And that's hard. And I know people would debate, oh, that doesn't what that means. You know, it could be this, it could be that, it could be predestination. I've heard that many times. And you know what? It's scripture. It probably could mean all of that too. But history proves what it meant. We know today, absolute rock-solid history backed up by scripture that the northern and southern kingdoms were conquered and occupied by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Mede-Persians, the Greeks, and by Jesus' day, the Romans. During its long history, Jerusalem has been attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, besieged 23 times, and completely destroyed twice. Today, we know what's going on with the embassy and all of that. So we're back to perpetual bloodshed. Need I say more? <clears throat> Next up on our time travel, we're going to be in first century Galilee. And we're going to be listening to Jesus talking to a large crowd that's gathered around him, and they're going to hear the parable of the sower. And I think there's some striking similarities to what we just heard and read about in Isaiah. And um, Jesus went on to say that some seed fell along the path and was trampled, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Some fell among thorns, which grew up, but were choked out by weeds. I think we all know that's the world. But some fell on good soil. It grew up and yielded a bumper crop. Then Jesus called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Apparently nobody understood. Because a short time later, we're assumed, sometime later anyway, the uh, disciples asked Jesus, what did all of that mean? What did it mean? And Jesus told them, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables so that, though seeing they may not see, through hearing they may not understand. It's a haunting reference to Isaiah 6-9. But this time... There's good news. This isn't part of a trial or another indictment against another part of mankind. Instead, we are given the parables meaning, which is the way. This is the way of the kingdom of God. Just like Bobby found the way, the way for him out of this terrible, terrible fix that was absolutely destroying his summer with the best place that he always wanted to go with grandma and grandpa was through the truth and he was set free through co confession. The seed, Jesus explains, is the word of God. Today we're blessed with a printed word in a variety of translations and medians. Some of us have iPhones and Droids and oh, it's just so many ways of doing it in the computers and then we still have the printed word which I still love so We have a huge advantage If I ever forget what I learned I can re read and, and relearn it be reminded and uh, It's it's pretty open There is not a parable that can't be explained by uh, theologians and so we're very very blessed today and I think that it's our responsibility to take care of that, that we have something that millions and millions of people that went before us don't have. It wasn't 
until in the last thousand years that anything like that even existed that was accessible to uh, the common people on the street. The good soil are those with a noble and good heart. And they're talking, Jesus was talking about us and the disciples, later the apostles, and those 100, original 100 that followed him around. What a great thing to be spoken about. A noble and good heart coming from the lips of God. That's about the best thing that could ever be said. Who hear the word, retain it, and produce a crop. But what about the people that hear the word and fall prey to the devil, who have no root, and in a time of testing fall away? What about them? Who are choked by life worries, riches, pleasures? I don't know. Fortunately, that's God's decision and not mine or any other man. So I know that he is a perfect judge and he mets out perfect justice. That he has more mercy than, than any of man could, could uh, imagine or will. So we have to trust him. But we do know, this we do know when we look around and think about the ones that we know. Those that are choked out, that are worried with the world don't mature. They never leave the cross and they don't produce any fruit. At this time, we're going to go to the next part of our service and Warren's going to lead us through a time of prayer and meditation and contemplation using our other scripture, Philippians 4. Now I know that many of us might think, oh, meditation and contemplation, that's kind of like, you know, Eastern mysticism and all that kind of stuff. But we are instructed by the Bible to do this. And uh, Paul, I didn't create it, Paul does this excellent um, meditation through Philippians 4. And for those that were like me for years and years said, oh, I can't meditate. Tried it, can't do it. I've got a monkey mind. My mind can take my checkbook and take off through this mental jungle, swinging through the limbs, and pretty soon I'm not even on the same planet. I can't slow it down. And that's the world. That's what the world has done for me. But there are ways to do that. And uh, we can direct our thinking. And I'm going to finish with this. Um, I heard a preacher a long time ago say, Anybody that worries can meditate. And he reasoned what we do is instead of worrying about problems and stresses and all of these things that plague us, think about the good things. Redirect your thoughts away from money and work and toward the joy of salvation. The day that you were baptized, play that out in your mind. Your child's newborn face. A healing from cancer, and there are those among us that have been healed from that. Think about how wonderful that is, that we're on the other side today. The person that was an end-stage alcoholic but now is sober. A broken relationship that's been repaired. Think about those things. And ask God, what kind of soil am I? That's what the chair's for. I don't know if you've seen him, but Jesus has been there a whole time. 